Welcome to the Basel Book Company on 88.9 Radio Milwaukee uh, virtual event. It is day 4,115 of Boswell being in business and what a night it is. We are so honored to be hosting um, Shel Zauner, the musician known as Japanese Breakfast, um, author of the viral 2018 New Yorker essay that uh, was perhaps, we'll find out tonight, the impetus for her new book, an unflinching powerful memoir about growing up Korean American, losing her mother and forging her own identity. Um, Zach Ruskin in the San Francisco Chronicle wrote in writing a memoir that will ultimately thrill Japanese breakfast fans and provide comfort to those in the throes of loss while brilliantly detailing the colorful panorama of Korean culture, traditions, and yes, food. Michelle Zauner has accomplished the unthinkable, a book that caters to all appetites and doesn't skimp on the kimchi. We are so honored tonight to be um, co-hosting this event with 88.9 Radio Milwaukee. And tonight, um, having the conversation with Justin Barney, the acclaimed and wonderful music director of Radio Milwaukee. Um, thank you both for coming and um, welcome to some virtual space that we are saying is Milwaukee. Thank you. <laughs> thank you for having us. Um, great. Well, I was going to start uh, with the passage, but I changed my mind over the, the course of this, this introduction because I felt um, I should re read a section about music since we're with Radio Milwaukee. So I'm going to read a, a passage from a chapter called Where's the Wine about my sort of teenage years when I, when I fell in love with music. On the off chance a band toured through Eugene, there were two venues to play. The Wow Hall was where I saw most local shows growing up. Menomina, Joanna Newsom, Bill Callahan, Mount Erie, and the Rock and Roll Soldiers who were the closest band Eugene could claim as hometown heroes. They wore headbands and leather vests with tassels that hung over their bare chests, and we admired them because they were the only people we knew who had left and accomplished something, a coveted major label deal and a slot in a Verizon wireless commercial. We never stopped to question if what they had com accomplished had been really been so great, why they were back in town to play so often. Bigger bands played the McDonald Theater, where I saw Modest Mouse and crowd surfed for the first time, spending a good 30 seconds on the edge of the stage beforehand to ensure someone in the front row would in fact catch me when I jumped. Isaac Brock was like a god to us. There was a rumor that his cousin lived in the next town over and in the trailer park that the song Trailer Trash is about. And this potential proximity made him all the more relatable, someone we could claim as our own. Everyone I knew had somehow memorized every word to his sprawling hundred track catalog, including the songs from his side projects and B-sides, coveted albums we were constantly trying to track down to burn and slip into the plastic sleeves of our CD binders. His lyrics epitomized what it felt like to grow up in a small gray town in the Pacific Northwest, what it was like to suffocate slowly from the boredom. His swelling 11 minute opuses and cathartic blood curdling screams soundtracked every long drive with nothing to think about. But nothing impacted me so profoundly as the first time I got my hands on a DVD of the Yeah Yeah Yeahs live at the Fillmore. The front woman, Karen O, was the first icon of the music world I worshiped who looked like me. She was half Korean and half white with an unrivaled showmanship that obliterated the docile Asian stereotype. She was famous for wild onstage antics, spitting water into the air, bounding across to the far edges of the stage and deep throating a microphone before lassoing it above her head by its cable. Agape at the image, I found myself in a strange state of ambivalence. My first thought being, how do I get to do that? And my second, if there's already one Asian girl doing this, then there's no longer space for me. Back then, I didn't know what a scarcity mentality was. The dialogue surrounding representation and music was in its nascent stages. And because I didn't personally know any other girls who played music, I didn't know there were others like me struggling with the same feelings. I didn't have the analogical capacity to imagine a white boy in the same situation, watching a live DVD of say, The Stooges and thinking if there's already an Iggy Pop, how could there possibly be room for another white guy in music? Nevertheless, Karen O made music feel more accessible, made me believe it was possible that someone like me could one day make something that meant something to other people. Fueled by this newfound optimism, I began to badger my mother incessantly for a guitar. 
Having already sunk a hefty sum on a long list of extracurriculars I'd summarily abandoned, she was reluctant to oblige, but by Christmas she finally broke down, and at last I received a $100 Yamaha acoustic in a box from Costco. The action was so high it felt like you had to wrestle the strings half an inch to pin them to the fret. I started taking lessons once a week at the most embarrassing place one can learn how to play the guitar, the Lesson Factory. The Lesson Factory was like the Walmart of guitar lessons. It was connected to the guitar center and inside there were about 10 soundproof cubicles, each equipped with two chairs and two amplifiers and your very own defeated musician recruited off Craigslist. I was lucky enough to be paired with a teacher I actually liked who must have considered me a welcome break for pre from prepubescent boys who exclusively wanted to learn how to play Green Day songs and the intro to Stairway to Heaven. The lessons couldn't have come at a better time. That same year, Nick Holly Gamer took the seat next to me in English and it felt like I'd won the lottery. I'd heard about him because he was Maya Brown's neighbor and ex-boyfriend. I didn't have any classes with Maya, but she was known to all of us because every boy in our grade had a crush on her. Infuriatingly, she was objectively pretty and popular, but masqueraded as a tormented alternative. She dyed her brown hair jet black, wore caramel colored corduroys and would write things on her arm and pen so she wouldn't forget them. Thoughts she later wrote in her live journal, which I followed assiduously, even though we weren't friends in real life. Her entries were made up of bright eyes lyrics conflated with her own romantic encounters and meandering ruminations largely written in the second person directed at someone anonymous who had either wronged her or for whom she desperately longed. I thought she was one of the great American poets of our time. Nick had shaggy blonde hair, painted his nails with white out and wore a silver hoop earring in one ear. In class, he was quiet and terribly slow like he was stoned all the time. He was constantly asking me when assignments were due and if he could borrow my notes, hapless requests that I deftly roped into my private mission to, to befriend him. In middle school, Nick had a band called the Barrow Whites. I didn't know anyone who played in a band and it felt impossibly cool that Nick already had one. They put out one EP before disbanding, which I diligently hunted down from a friend of a friend. It was a burned disc folded inside a homemade paper envelope with drawings and titles written in Sharpie. As soon as I got home, I slipped the disc into the boom box I kept on my desk. I sat on a rolling chair and listened, hold, still holding the paper envelope in my clammy hands as I poured over the lyrics, imagining Nick Holly Gamer's wildly sexually experienced past. There were five tracks, the last a song called Molly's Lips. I wondered if Molly was another one of his many exes, or if it was perhaps a pseudonym for Maya Brown. I was too stupid to know that Molly's Lips was actually just a Nirvana cover, and I'd like to think that Nick was at least too stupid to know that Nirvana was covering the Vaselines. Uh, Michelle, thank you for that. <laughs> <laughs> um, the book, of course, is Crying in H Mart. Um, uh, and uh, one of my favorite parts about reading the book, of course, like I'm big on writing in the margins, was also making a playlist of every song that you mentioned. Oh, uh, yeah. And uh, listening to them. And I even got like some of the, I'm like the Pearl Sisters only had some of the titles in like Korean. And I was yeah. able to like figure, figure that it out. out. That's yeah. amazing. So write, writing that was, um, was, or making that was really fun. And um, because you are a musician and you have, you, the book is about um, your relationship with your mother largely. And uh, um, you cover that in, in Psychopomp and in Soft Sounds from Another Planet. Um, I wanna talk to you about writing because that had to be such an experience. Um, in the first chapter of this, of the book, you say that um, you found yourself again, searching for the first chapter of this story that you wanna tell about your mother um, while you're in, a in H Mart. How, when did you know that this was gonna be a book? Um, it happened in stages really. I wrote an essay in 2016 called Love, Loss and Kimchi that largely makes up, I think it's chapter 18 or 17 called Mangchi and Me. And it really, it just started as an ode to Mangchi, who is this uh, Korean YouTube vlogger who has like, I think, five million subscribers or something. And she really 
has demystified um, the Korean cooking process for a lot of English speakers. And um, I just thought it was a cute story really that you know this woman I'd never met had come to mean so much to me during this very difficult time. And that I was you know, cooking with her every week and um, it was really helping me with the grieving process. And it was sort of like a, like a cute Korean Julie and Julia story. And in the process of writing that, I sort of began to realize, um, you know, this was my first time really writing nonfiction and, and that there was such a bigger story to tell. And there were so many interesting things that happened in this like whirlwind six months. Um, and that was the sort of beginning. It, it took a year for that, I think, to be published. And it won Glamour Magazine's Essay of the Year contest. And from that, there were a number of agents that sort of reached out to me um, that they also kind of felt like there was a larger story to tell. But around that same time, Psychopimp had come out and was doing really well for the first time. Like there, it was it was gaining traction in this way that I'd never really experienced in music before. And, and so I kind of set it off to the side for a while and was like, I think I need to go and see how this is gonna pan out mu my music career. And then in 2017, the band did a tour in Asia and we ended in Seoul and I stayed behind for six weeks and started writing sort of casually, but seriously, uh, what I thought could be the beginning of a book. Um, and I wrote maybe the first six chapters and the first one was Crying in Age Bar. And so when that was published in the New Yorker in 2018, there was just an overwhelming flood of support that came for that essay and a number of agents that reached out to me. And, and then the book, um, we put together a proposal and it was won an auction by Knopf. And that sort of gave me the means to, to really focus and hunker down for the next three years um, writing the book. But I, I feel like I knew pretty early on and I think being a musician and having made these larger, navigated larger creative projects of making records um, kind of gave me the confidence to try to, to take something like this on. And also I studied creative writing in, in college and so I, I had some um, experience with uh, short fiction from that. So I felt like I had some of the tools to try to sort of navigate this. Yeah, I was wondering if you had like felt like you always had a book in you when like being a creative writing major. I don't know. I mean, I never, ever thought I would write a book like this. Certainly. I mean, of course, how would I have known? But um, I never was interested in writing nonfiction. You know, I took I loved my creative writing courses in college. And I had one professor in particular that I just adored named Daniel Torde, who taught me so much about writing. And I took every single class he offered except for nonfiction because I just never, you know, I think especially being mixed race, I never wanted to write stories about identity. I never wanted to write stories that involve so much pretext. I wanted to write this like sort of gritty, um, you know, working class short fiction. And um, I thought maybe I might write a novel someday or, or a collection of short stories, but I never, ever thought I would write a story what? like this. Well, I think that was one of like the real joys of reading this book is like, there are arcs, you know, like you have arcs, you have themes that come back and connect to each other. You have like a like reoccurring bits. There is satisfaction. There's like a low that goes into a high and just like the natural reading of this book was, was, it was, it was so great as a reader, you know, and, and as a you. person that reads a lot of books, it was very satisfying. Did you, did you like journal during this time? Because so much of it is, it's so full and detailed. No, not really. I really wish that I had because it would have made things a lot easier. And I think that if I wrote another book, I would really want it to be rooted in a journal because it would have been so, so helpful. But a lot of it was just, you know, um, free writing for a really long time and then finding the moments and then taking sort of deep, deep dives into you know, picking them apart and trying to remember what happened. I mean, some things came easier than others, certainly, but there were certain parts you just had to like kind of live with on paper for a long time and sort of return to over and over again and kind of just try to place yourself back in the moment and remember and just sort of extrapolate like weird little memories from, you know. Yeah. I remember one part that was really hard for me was um, this chapter called Living and Dying and trying to remember what happened, you know, in the hospital when, when they told us that my mom was going into septic shock and might be turned, might be put onto a ventilator. 
Um, I remember my dad and I went out to a bar to just had, sort of figure out what we were going to do because we were going to have to maybe make this decision of how long she was going to be on this ventilator before um, we decided to discontinue. And, uh, you know, I couldn't really remember what happened. And, you know, in order for it to make it to make it believable that we went out and she came back and all of a sudden she was fine, I needed to really extend this period of time and to be back in this moment that was like so traumatic for me was really, really hard. And it took a lot of sort of walking away and taking months mm -hmm. away from those types of moments and returning to them and just expanding on small moments. Like I just, I do remember my dad, you know, just like looking so defeated and um, sitting at a picnic table where he kind of picked at the surface of it. And it, you know, like, like it took a long time, but it's just, you know, putting yourself back there where like, you know, uh, it was a wild experience and in and, and, and such a great learning lesson writing this book of, of learning how to extrapolate those sort of moments to, to have pacing work and, and that type of thing. Well, I, I want to talk about some of those themes because I think you did a really great job of like having a couple like basic huge themes and, and working off of those um, kind of like the biggest is like your mother's very specific type of love. Mm. And uh, uh, I was wondering if you could describe the way that your mother loved. Yeah, in the book, I, I describe it as sinewy and industrial strength. Um, I think that for so long, you know, I never really had Asian friends growing up, you know, and I, I, I didn't have any friends actually that had immigrant parents, which was a huge thing. And so, so much of the way that I saw my mother was this sort of like idiosyncratically cruel character. Um, and I didn't realize how much of her type of love or her character was really rooted in a culture I didn't know very much about, you know, that this was a really common way that mothers love their daughters and, uh, and people, elders sort of acted to their children um, that I just, I didn't have any friends who had moms like this. So, mm -hmm. you know, every time I got hurt, my mother would just start screaming and she would be so upset at me while all my friends uh, would be sort of taken to the doctor or would be very, very coddled. And, um, you know, my mother-in-law is, is a, a Caucasian woman and is, you know, what I would describe as a sort of mommy mom. And, um, you know, I remember when I got fired uh, as a waitress, like sh my mother-in-law would say something along the lines of they don't, you know, oh, like they don't know what they're missing out on. You're like such an industrious worker. And I can't believe they did that to you. Like you deserve so much better. Whereas my mom would just say, you know, well, Michelle, anyone can hold a tray. <laughs> and so, I mean, she just really, I think, um, you know, the more that I, I, I meet people with immigrant parents and specifically Korean American parents or Korean parents, um, I realized that that type of tough love is, is, is very common, you know, and um, it's their way of toughening you and preparing you for the world in a specific way. And um, yeah, that was just something that was very difficult for me to understand growing up, how, how critical she could be and, and uh, where her love was based. And, but there, there, uh, you did a good job of bringing it across that there is, um, there is love in there too. And there was, a, there was a, a, a sentence where you had, you said that was, that was how my mother loved, not through white lies through, uh, or through constant verbal affirmation, but through subtle observations of what brought you joy. And, uh, um, and like, and noting those is a type of love, you know, her walking in the boots, you know, yeah, before yeah, sending yeah. them over this kind of like suffering and sacrifice as love. And uh, um, also like withholding is a big part of that love. And like the first time that you mentioned like saving 10%, in the book, I was like, there's an idea. What is that? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then also like, I love how you like loop that back a couple of times and, and that came through. Can you explain the, you know, the, the saving 10% of your mother's love? Yeah. I, I was asked about this yesterday and I, I, it's basically, you know, uh, don't trust a bitch. Like, <laughs> <laughs> um, my mom was a, you know, she just was a tough lady. And like, I think that she, you know, that was a major lesson that she wanted to impart was to, to protect yourself. And that, you know, there were, there would always, that no one would love me ever, uh, as much as she did. And that you had to, um, that the real world, you had to enter sort of guarded and, and protect yourself because no one was going to look out for you the way that, that you would, or your family would. And, 
Um, it was some, it was a very difficult lesson for me to learn because I've always been such a hard on the sleeve kind of person. And I think in some ways that's a sort of American ideal that, um, you know, was maybe a little bit foreign to her. Um, mm -hmm. And there was this sort of withholding uh, sort of stoic nature to her that, that she really felt like was a major lesson to, to impart to me, to protect well, you, myself. And you, um, you contrast that with your dad. On, uh, on page 81, you say, um, he didn't know how to withhold any part of his truth. Unlike my mother, he saved no 10%. Um, what do you do? I think I'm like a 5%. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm very much like, I do think I, I definitely um, have kept that lesson uh, very close to my heart, especially after my mother passed away and I realized, um, I think, you know, how wide, I think I just didn't give her as much credit as she deserved until after she passed away. And um, I really value those lessons more than I ever did when she was alive. And um, I definitely, you know, I, I, I realize now that I, I protect myself in a certain way and I do withhold in a certain amount, but I, maybe not 10%, maybe more like 5%. <laughs> what do you think is better? I don't know. I, I really, I think because it's much harder for me to withhold, I think that I really admire that about her. Um, and mm. I wish that I was more capable of doing that. But I'm also an artist, you know, I'm a creative person. And so much of what I do as someone who shares so much of my personal life is, is go to certain places where I think other people aren't willing to go or, or um, you know, expose uh, some more private things or more shameful things that, that you know, other people keep a little bit more hidden. So uh, I think it's, a, I have to be a little bit more open uh, than she was in a way. Um, but I do really admire that quality and, and, and envy it and, 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 and think it's a, it's a good thing. Why is it a good thing? I mean, you just always protect yourself. You know, I think that people um, always have their, I, I think people always have their, um, their interests at heart. And that's an important thing to remember um, and sort of guard yourself from, you know, and uh, shit will hit the fan always. And, and to always have something to fall back on, I think is really important. Cause there, cause there is like a part of me that is like, you know, being, being an artist is being vulnerable is yeah. having 0%, you know, and, and giving 100%, but then like, as a person, I am like, I, I also deeply respect, you know, keeping that because that is that mystery is like equally as as important. And, uh, you know, it feels like in the book that that is that like 10 percent is the part that you're always you always you need to earn it, you know, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. uh, and you're always going for it when you're in the book, when your mom is is diagnosed, it's a real low point. And then you counter it with, let's get married. <laughs> <laughs> um, what was that? That was, it was such, it was such a, a like, I know it was your life, but it was such a, a great arc. It was like such a great intersection of those arcs. And I, you know, I think like when you're in that moment, you're probably not, you know, you kind of are intentionally, you're intentionally, you know, you're intentionally shifting that energy and pushing yeah. it. Um, what, what were, what was that decision? Yeah. I mean, we were absolutely trying to change that narrative. I mean, that chapter is called living and dying. It was definitely the hardest chapter for me to write in the book. And, you know, that title even is very much, um, what, what that moment was sort of about. I mean, we had decided after my mother, you know, we, after my mother decided to discontinue chemotherapy because we had learned that you know the two sessions that she had done hadn't shrunk her tumor at all um you know she was her health had sort of stabilized the doctor said it was not the greatest idea for us to travel to korea but it was something that she wanted to do and it was like she was choosing living over dying you know it was, it was like well i i want to i want to take this gamble and i want to try to have this beautiful experience in my home country i want to say goodbye to my family i want to travel to jeju island and you know, sit on the beaches and eat the, you know, the food that I grew up with. And um, instead, we were just sent straight back into the hospital and her health deteriorated so rapidly. And it was such a tragically horrible 
loss, you know, that we had made this gamble and we had just lost. And, Mm -hmm. you know, we were in the hospital and my mom, you know, was at this place where she had just honestly, for the first time said to me, what am I even living for anymore? You know, there's nothing enjoyable about this. And she went into septic shock. Um, The doctors had informed us that they would have to put her on a ventilator any minute, that this was really looking like the end. And my father and I went out to a bar, we came back and suddenly, she had really just come out of it. She had turned this corner out of nowhere and it made no sense. And so I went out into the fire escape and I called my boyfriend at the time. We had been dating for like a year and a half. And I just said, listen, if you think that this, that we might get married in the next five years and we don't just do it now, I don't think I could ever forgive you. And he just said, okay. (laughs) And we uh, planned a wedding in three weeks and we did a medical evacuation back to Eugene, Oregon. And I think it was just my, you know, I I talk about in the book, it was just a way to, you know, all we could, all we were talking about were like, you know, creams and, and, you know, nutrition bags and hydrocodone and, you know, all of these like horrible things that no one wants to talk about. And that we had this event that was like macaroons and chivari cherries and, you know, dresses. and, And I just knew, you know, as an only child, as an only daughter, that that would bring my mom so much joy. And it wasn't something yeah. that was really imp- very important to me, but I knew that, you know, if I did ever get married and she wasn't there, I would just constantly think of what would she think of all this. And so I just felt like it was a way to sort of turn around the moment, you know, and, and I was really lucky that I had a partner that, that sort of went for it with me and that it really worked out. And at the time, you know, I really thought, no one has ever done this before, you know, but I've come to learn that I've heard so many stories of this happening of someone's parent getting sick and and a lot of weddings planned with this sort of, um, you know, emergency in mind and a lot of parents actually not making it for these weddings. And so I was so lucky um, that she was able to be there. And that was such a happy moment, happy last moment that we could have together. Um, and she held out for it, you know, she went into a coma like a week after the wedding. And so in, in, in a way it was her, it was this beautiful ceremony that sort of let her, gave her the opportunity to like let go and have one last really beautiful memory together. And that, that is really what it, what it, it, like I, reading it, it felt like it, it gave her life because when you're in that time and you're just, everything is doom and gloom, you know? Yeah. to like be able to have that. And I also loved how it brought back Peter, you know, in, <laughs> in, in, in the book, you, you were like, you wrote about Peter and I was like, oh, this poor guy, you know, <laughs> like they're so young, you know, like he is like, he's gonna get at some point in this book, it's gonna be, we're either just gonna not hear about Peter again, or there's going to be, he couldn't handle it, or this was too much to bear. And uh, um, and Peter ends up being uh, this wonderful uh, like part Hero, of yeah, the book. Yeah. What what does Peter do? Peter plays in the band. He's the guitar player in the band. I love that you bring him up though because I feel like um, you know a lot of people are like I was really rooting for him, you know, and I, and like it's great that he turned out to be a really great guy. And you know I I don't even know what I would do if I would I had been. In his situation, I would like to believe that I would, I could have been as stand up of a guy as he was during that time. But, you know, it's such a tough thing to completely be there for someone as they're just really going through it. And there's nothing you can really do, you know, and how helpless it must feel to be someone's partner during that time. I, I mean, he was really an exceptional partner. And I think in a lot of ways, it really prepared us for our marriage because it was like, like, you know, if we can get through this, like we can, we can really get through anything. Um, uh, and, and when you, like, when you first wrote about him, you wrote, it was written with love and it was, it was written in a way where I was like, surely this guy can't last, but uh, <laughs> it sounds like it probably ended in a good way or she like, she has good things to say. And uh, cause there was obvious love in there when like, even at the first mention, um, you you wrote about how his um, how he is very literate as well, yeah. and and then I was watching. Uh, you had an Instagram story the other day where you got number two on the bestseller list. <laughs> Congratulations! Uh, that thank is you, thank huge. You. Thank you. And I much. think you were just kind of like dunking on George Bush. And, <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yes. Because yes, he has number. He had the number one. And, yeah. Number one. Yeah. 
And he just kind of like eviscerated George Bush in like one sentence. He said something like, he was like, oh, leading, yeah. he was like all of them were, were like competing for the topic sentence or something like that. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, yeah. it was like true, like literary criticism as like an offhanded joke. And I was like, if I was married to that and I wrote a book, I would be scared as hell. Um, <laughs> no, I've been so lucky. Lucky, you know, my husband was, uh, you know, has read these chapters and in, in so many different stages. And I was very lucky to have this sort of like built in, you know, married in like first reader and, and wonderful editor in, in so many ways. So I, you know, sometimes I would literally just like write a new sentence and be like, what do you think of this? You know, I was like so codependent on him. Um, but yeah, he was he was a wonderful part of the process. And, and I'm, I'm very, very lucky that I, I have such a, a literate husband. <laughs> In your in your vows, you had you yes, yeah, his vows. <laughs> well, his, uh, but in, in yours, you said uh, that love is an action, an instinct, a response roused by unplanned moments and small gestures, an inconvenience at someone else's favor, which sounds very much like you're channeling your mother's uh, mm. the definition of her love. Mm. Um, how is how oh, is your so love? Thoughtful. Thank you. How is your love of? Uh, how is your love for Peter and your love for your mother different? Gosh, um, well, I feel like Peter is a lot like nicer than my mom was. <laughs> so it's like easier a little bit. Um, you know, I think in some ways they're like weirdly similar in some ways. They're both like, you know, my mom could be very like patient and, and thoughtful about things. And I, I feel like Peter is like that um, in so many ways. Um, but you know what, I, I feel like I almost love Peter the way, I mean, I'm, he's not like my child or anything, but I, my mother really taught me how to love people. And I think that I love, I love people the way that my mother loved me. And I can see so much of um, the way that my mother loved me and the way that I, I love my husband and the way that I, I know I know all the things that he likes and I, and I, I have pocket away, you know, like if we, you know, I'm not to always bring everything back to food, but you know, like if we go to a restaurant, like I know what he's going to order before he probably even does. Right. I know like the way that he's you're... had a long, yeah, I know if he's had a long day, I know when he's like hungry before he knows that he's hungry. I know like, um, when he should get a haircut before he gets a, he thinks to get a haircut. Yeah. You know, I think that yeah. it's just stuff like that. Like um, my mother very much loved me in that way of like, no one, no one was obsessed with me the way that my mother was obsessed with me. And, and I, no one is obsessed with my husband the way they're obsessed with him. So, um, and that way I feel like I actually love the way that my mother loved me. The way that I love my mother. I mean, it was, a, it was a more selfish type of love, I think, because it was, it was this, um, you know, like, I think that's the sort of relationship that you have with your parent for a long time where it's like, you know, they, they are giving to you constantly. You don't even yeah. think about giving to them because that's like, that's the <laughs> dynamic, you know? And I think that part of what the book is about so much is like, what was so heartbreaking about it is I think that we were just entering that sort of turning point where, yeah. um, you know, we were beginning to really love each other as peers in this way our relationship was changing I was an adult um in my you know early 20s and uh all of the sort of like rotten behavior of my adolescence was starting to melt away and mature into something where we could you know really communicate with each other and she could confide in me for the first time and it's very sad to me that we didn't get to have more of that and I only you know got to sort of shift that love around in the last six months of her life and you know, I was, I was so young. I was 25. I didn't know like how to um, be a better caretaker. I didn't, I, I wasn't ready for that role reversal in it so quickly. And, um, you know, I think that that was my chance to really try to, to flip that love around in a way. And it, it was a very short lived uh, flip. Yeah. I mean, there's that thing about moms, you know, like my mom, I'm always like, I'm, I just want her to love me. You know, mm -hmm. I want like, I want her to love me. And she does, you know, she that, does, that's, yeah. that's the thing is like, she does. But I'm like, but I don't feel it, you know? <laughs> like I, you say that, but like I want to feel it, mom. Like give me that love. And there's that point where she says that she never met somebody like you. I think that's such a great point because I think my mom has said like probably that exact same thing where it's like, that's like her being like, you're human yeah. and I have to understand you. Yeah, yeah. Um, of course, at at one point, uh, your mother passes, and you're you're at her funeral, and you don't cry. 
even though the so many times in the book you had written, you know, save your tears for when your mother dies. Um, uh, and then she does it and you don't cry. Why, why don't you think you cried at the, at the service? I think I did cry a little bit, but you know, it, it wasn't, it's such an intense thing, you know? I mean, there's so much pressure to like feel a certain way in this like concentrated moment. And also, you know, as her only daughter and like having a father that, you know, needed a lot of emotional help, um, I think it was, I was, I was so, I think that it's just a natural thing that like, you know, I felt this responsibility to take care of things and to take care of other yeah. people. I and that. I think that when you feel like that on your shoulders, you have to kind of like suck it up in this way. Yeah. And it wasn't until, you know, after the service when everything was kind of done and we went to dinner that I was just like able to like kind of let out a breath and like my responsibility in that moment was sort of over. And that's when this sort of floodgates like broke down. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think that that's a big thing. I think that like, it's it's just um, when when you are shouldering a lot of weight and responsibility, I think that you just um, you just shut off in this way. You know? yeah. yeah, and 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 you did, it's not like you didn't cry. You know, it's, like, yeah. it's not like you haven't sense. It was I like have you plenty just, of like, tears. You had to hold it. <laughs> um, my, probably my favorite part of the book uh, is the story is, is it, is it Quing, Q-U-I-N-G? I think her name's Ching, yeah. Ching. Um, that was my favorite part. Oh, thank you. Those are moments that I live for. Um, can can you can you can you tell that uh, that story? Sure. Yeah. Um, it, it's such a like cinematic moment, I think, in the yeah. book, and uh, felt that way at the time. It was just kind of like, you know, the perfect person that you never see again. Um, that kind of like changes you in that moment you know like and I think that that's like something that's so beautifully a part of the human experience it's like these sort of happenstance moments that uh change you change the course of your life like unintentionally or unbeknownst to them forever after my mom passed away um you know my dad and I were just stuck alone in this house like really freaked out because like we had never really spent much time alone together we were really held mm -hmm. together our relationship was very held together by my mother and um we decided to take a trip together to get out of the house like two weeks after she died to Vietnam we took like a three-week trip which in retrospect is crazy but <laughs> um at the time it seemed like this really great idea to just sort of distract us from what was going on and my dad and I just got into this huge fight we were in central Vietnam in the city called Hue which is the former capital and um, we went out to dinner and he was just being very cringy and like really getting on my nerves. Um, just the way that like, you know, if you've worked in the food service industry, like, and you're with someone who hasn't or like hasn't in a really long time and just everything that you do, it's like they're being sort of unintentionally kind of like rude to the waiter and like, you know, just like roping you into this. And uh, we got into this huge fight and I just stormed off because like everything had reached this boiling point and, and we had kind of like hurled these sort of like um, insults at one another. And, and uh, you know, I, I just stormed off and I, I wandered into this karaoke bar um, in Hue, like a locals, like only kind of karaoke bar. And this girl named Ching, like who was a Vietnamese girl who wanted to be a singer, you know, uh, saw me sitting alone at a table and she came over with her little cup of tea and I was drinking a beer and she was like, why are you here? <laughs> like, I've never seen a tourist here. And uh, she's like, I'm sad, you know, like I had a hard day. And I was like, I'm sad too. And it was like the first time um, that I had told a stranger that uh, my mom had died. And I think just saying that, those words out loud uh, for the first time was like a real um, change in me in that moment. And uh, yeah, we just sang karaoke into the night together. And I feel like she just really helped me um, maybe just like forgive my father and move on in that moment or just like was just like this like um, unexpected companion in the night uh, that like yeah just helped me in that moment when I needed someone and I, I never saw her again. And I, I'm sure, I don't know if she thinks about me ever, but, uh, you know, it was a really important part of, uh, of my grieving process in a weird way. And, and I love, I love that she comes in in this one night and then she's a moment in your life and then you've never talked. And I think there's an instinct to be like, 
I think people would be like, you should reach back out. And I'm like, yeah. no, you should not. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. like that, like why it's, it would only like, why ruin the like perfection? Um, you sang, you sang the Carpenters and she said that it would help you out. Why did you sing um, the song from the Carpenters? And it, did it help you in that moment? Like she said it would. Yeah, we, I sang Rainy Days and Mondays. Yeah. And I think I just sang that song, you know, because I had just gotten married two weeks or maybe a month before that, that trip. And this, the song that my husband and I danced, that was the song that my husband and I danced to. So maybe in that moment, I just was like thinking of him, wishing he was there, you know, and, and um, thinking of a happier time, I guess. And yeah, I mean, like, it's funny because like I... I don't even think I realized in writing that, you know, like there was also this feeling of like, I'm giving up me, I'm going to give up music, you know, right. um, at that time, you know, I was 25 and, and my mom had just died. I had been playing in bands since I was 16. And I was realizing like, if, if this hasn't worked out for me, it's not going to work out, you know, and I need to let it go. And um, I'm going to move to New York after all this is over. And I'm going to just go and climb the corporate ladder for a while and, and put this, this dream aside. Then here was this girl that I met in Vietnam that also had these same kind of dreams, wanted to be a singer, had parents like mine, like my, like my mom who, who, you know, didn't believe in her. And that was bringing her sadness and frustration. And uh, here we were like from two totally different parts of the world going through the same kind of thing. And, uh, you know, uh, yeah, I mean, I guess she wanted me to sing because she she had still had this like very pure belief that, you know, music could heal. And I, I had sort of like at that point kind of stopped believing in that. And in that moment, singing that song kind of um, lifted my spirits in this way that I had forgotten that, that uh, music could have this sort of power to do. And it's such a sad, beautiful song. And, you know, Karen Carpenter is like the perfect example of this like really tragic, like heroine that sort of is just like wasting away at like striving for perfection. And uh, yeah, I mean, it was just like kind of this, one of those like beautiful serendipitous moments that can happen in, in real life. I'm what glad you that you bring up that, that chapter actually, because I haven't really talked about that in, in any of these, events yeah. and I, I love that chapter so much and I'm glad that we get to talk about it me too I like travel alone a lot and it's like those are that's why I travel alone yeah for like yeah. moments like that you know and meeting totally. somebody like that and like I like having a connection with a stranger I think like, it's a hard thing to do I'm not one to like approach someone um but like every time something like that happens I am like it's the greatest and I feel um, like it only ever happens when you're alone, honestly, because like, it does. you know, I never travel alone. Honestly, I'm like a very codependent person and I, it's like horrifying to me, but um, I have heard that from people who travel alone is that, you know, if you're with a couple, like if you're with your partner or something, like it's very rare, like, you know, people think that you have company. So they, you know, if you're traveling alone, sometimes like locals will feel kind of bad for you and they'll wonder like, why don't they, maybe I should invite them or something. Um, and so, yeah, in this a situation I had wandered off from my dad and I think that she just felt really bad for me or could sense that something was wrong and, and wanted to, you know, reach out. And uh, yeah, I feel like that kind of thing only happens when you're on your own in a foreign country sometimes. I think so too. And, and like when you are like with someone, you are, you know, it's, it's the same. And I, there's something special about like meeting someone and there's like exciting, you know, uh, of, of meeting this person and their ideal to you. And you've like just had this moment and it's like, then it is, it's ideal. Totally. Um, well, a lot of this book is about food. And I, I had wondered in like kind of a, a, one of the things that you say about your mom is you kind of like harp on her for um, having like pedestrian interests or like not really having an interest outside of like being a mother and homing the stead. Um, but food seemed like a, it's like rules went out the window, you know? <laughs> and she had, to, she seemed to like have this passion for food and like a deeper understanding. Do you think that that's why you connect to it and and to her because it was like this interest kind of like outside of that idea of her that you had yeah I mean I think that the reason I think that maybe a lot of like young feminists of like my generation um 
you know, kind of had this way of looking down on, on, on mothers that were homemakers because, you know, you're sort of taught at a young age, like to, you know, and it was so important for my mom, for my mother, for me, um, to, to forge my own path and find a passion and a career and, and, um, work hard and, and, and whatnot. And so I, I, you know, there wasn't as, as nuanced of an understanding of feminism and I, and the sort of, and like what invisible, the sort of invisible labors of, of homemaking are. And so I was always just so curious, like, it, is this it? Like, is this all that you want to do? You know, like, why don't you have a job? Why don't you, you know, and just, mm-hmm. and so selfishly not seeing all the things that she was doing for my father and I, and um, not understanding sort of what goes into to taking care of people and being a mother and, and taking care of a home. But um, yeah, I think that uh, for her, food was, um, and, and I don't think I realized this when I was younger, but food was very much what tied her to her family. And, and I think that she was, you know, probably pretty homesick a lot more than, than she ever let on or that I ever even understood. You know, she had grown up in Korea her whole life and uh, all of her family and all of her friends and everything that she had known was in this country that she left behind and had to start over with this daughter and husband. And, um, you know, she never told me that but Mm. I I real I only realized that sort of later on after talking to her sister and sort of thinking about her in this new way and writing this book and I just remembered you know it just gave her so much joy every time we went to the Korean grocery store and and there was like this new import and she was like oh my god now I can make this thing and I used to eat this thing with my my mom would make this in the summertime and now like I get to have it too and like I haven't eaten in this in years and like every time we went to Korea her sister would be like write down all of the things that you want to eat and she would make this huge list of all the different places that we had to go and so it was such a celebration like joy uh, you know it was such a joy for us to eat together and it was always like she made you know that was a big part of her responsibility was like feeding the family and so yeah she always just made it into like such an event you know it was like on a on a night like this in Philadelphia it's like 80 degrees for the first time and so like if that was you know if we were in Oregon I just know that like my mom would be like oh my god like it's 80 degrees out we're like bringing the butane burner out onto the patio I've like bought all of this like pork belly and we're gonna like barbecue it on the on the patio and have um you know lettuce wraps with samjang and rice and kimchi and you know, we just had to like, you know, or if it was raining outside, then then she'd be like, oh, today's like a day for sujibu. It's just a time to like chill out, eat this hot soup with like doughy like noodles and, um, you know, like warm up in, inside. You know, she just like had a meal for everything. And it was always yeah. like such an event. And, um, you know, I, I just I grew up in that way. Both of my parents, honestly, had a real love of food in that way. It always just felt like such a celebration. And I think that you know, when she got sick, it was just like such a heartbreaking thing to like watch food become something that was a labor, you know, and it was, uh, yeah. you know, even, even grotesque at times of just like, you know, uh, I remember it was like such a relief when we were in a hospital and she got like a nutrition bag because we just like, didn't have to think like, I don't have to count calories anymore because she just is taken care of. And like how sad that is that like her, you know, she had all these sores on her mouth. It was difficult for her to enjoy food at all. And I think so much of why I kind of returned to food in this way was, um, you know, to, to remember like what life was like before disease entered our lives and, um, to, to retain that. And, um, yeah, just like, remember what our life was like, uh, when, when food was a celebration and to make sure that I preserved these parts of my culture that I, that, that were, you know, I didn't want to get lost with her. Yeah. And that is also such an act of love uh, and, and of like, not the love where like she is like, you know, being withholding or saying something mean where you like, you know that, that it's love, but like a, like a, such an innocent act of love to be like, it's 80 degrees outside. I've mm-hmm. made all this food. I've yeah, yeah. put all this thought into it. Like, let's just enjoy. That is, that is such, um, that is such an act of love. Um, and then you like pick it up with Mangchi, and then she was a moderator on this book tour. How was that? Was it sick? It was amazing. Yeah, I mean, I'm so so lucky because I feel like you're never supposed to really meet your heroes, and and right. she has been someone that's been very very warm and very generous with me. And I think that um, you know she has had this experience with a lot of people who have like 
she's really touched the lives of and 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 she's really taken on that responsibility of like sort of caring for people um in this way but yeah i mean she's really looked out for me i i i gave her my essay in in 2016 and and she we've sort of kept in touch since then and actually um I did this show with Munchies um, about sort of fusion foods and uh, invited her to do the Korean episode with me. And it was, we shot it the day before my 30th birthday. And I told her, oh, tomorrow's my birthday. And, and she was like, oh, come over. And so she <laughs> she had me and my husband and my best friend over for dinner on my 30th birthday at her apartment. Oh she, she made bulgogi and like got me a little cake and bought some soju. Oh and my I ate God. her kimchi and it was like, um, yeah, it was just like, I just feel so lucky. And and so she actually, it's really funny because, you know, she called me because she'd never done a Zoom before. And she's like, oh yeah, all these people, all these people keep asking me to just do Zooms. And like, I, I, I say no to all of them, but you know, uh, and she was like, oh yeah. And, and Justin Bieber's ex-girlfriend asked me to do a Zoom. And I said, no. And I was like, Selena Gomez. And she was like, yeah, I said no, but for you, I'll do it for you, Michelle, because you're so pretty and you know, you're so special to me. And so I, I, I'm, I'm very lucky, you know, it's, she's very like, she has a lot of integrity. And, and, and so her time is very valuable and, and, and precious. And, and I'm, I'm very lucky that she um, has been so generous to, to do that for me. That is so freaking cute. That yeah, is. it's just very, she's like the cutest woman. I, I just, I just love her. That is unreal. Um, on, in our like last couple minutes here, um, can you explain what it means to have a dream about shit? Yes. Um, whenever my mom had a dream about shit, um, particularly if you touch it, uh, <laughs> she would buy a scratch card. And I, rem- I, in the book, I talk about, um, you know, every time we would, she would drop me off at school. Sometimes she would wordlessly pull into a 7-Eleven parking lot. And I'd be like, what are you doing? I have to get to school. Why are you going to 7-Eleven? What are you getting? And she'd be like, just don't talk to me right now. And she would come out with a scratch card. And every time she had a dream about poop, it was like a good luck dream. And, and there were certain sort of signs. If you meet the president, especially if you shake hands with the president or a celebrity, um, or if you see a pig or you touch a pig, uh, or if you um, see shit or touch, especially if you touch shit, um, you should buy a scratch card. It's the good luck trick. <laughs> <laughs> that was so funny. I was like, that's one I'm just adding right to my life. You know? Yeah, it's great. <laughs> like, and it is fun. It's, it's one of those things that I, I always think of her. And every time I have a dream about shit, I, I, I think of my mom and I buy a scratch card. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, two more questions. Um, uh, do you believe in an afterlife? Um, I don't, uh, honestly. And, uh, you know, I mean, there's, I'm not a religious person. I'm not really a spiritual person. Um, but, you know, and that was really hard for me when my mother passed away because, um, you know, I mean, there are certain things like that just go against my belief, um, that I do weirdly believe in, you know, and this weird, I don't believe in an afterlife. And yet there is a part of me that really believes that, my mom is looking out for me in in this way. Um, And I know that those two things are totally at odds with one another. And yet I have to like, you know, I I had, I I did see a therapist for some time and, and, and she really helped me like understand that it was okay for things to be at odds with each other, like logically, if it, if they help you psychologically. And um, I've sort of kept that with me. And so, you know, I was thinking like, you know, if you don't, if you don't, if you're not religious and you don't believe in um, an afterlife, then why do you leave flowers on the on your loved one's grave? You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. It, the logical part of my brain says the reason why you're doing that is like you're creating this ritual for yourself, um, and it's yourself mm-hmm. like taking time to honor it. But honestly, that's just not enough for me. I have mm-hmm. to believe that my mom feels it or knows that her daughter is leaving flowers. And even though those two things are at odds with one another, um, I have to create this sort of suspension of disbelief um, to allow the space for that to be the thing, uh, even though they're at odds with one another. In the same way that I do believe in some way my mom is looking out for me, even though I don't believe in an afterlife. So no, but yes. <laughs> That's what I felt, you know, like yeah. at the end, I was like, I, I, I felt those two things coming together. Um, and then at, so it, I host a show called from the music desk on Sunday at eight, and I'm going to play the songs from this and play some. Oh, thank you. That's so sweet. And I, I love would, that. 
I would love for, uh, I would love to know what's a song that you've been listening to recently that you really love that we could talk about and then I could, you know, end the show maybe or, or end or go into it at some point. Um, the one that comes uh, to mind, I guess, is, um, is Dolly Parton's uh, Here You Come Again, which is, um, you know, I don't know, obviously Dolly Parton has so many like amazing hits, but I feel like it's such a perfect song. It has like five key changes and um, I covered it recently in a session and it took me so long to learn how to play on the piano, but it's just like such an amazing feel good song. It's like truly the most perfect pop song. And um, I don't think she wrote it actually, which just means that like, you have to be a seriously, like a serious composition wizard in order to write a song like Good Enough for Dolly. And um, I think it's like kind of her sleeper hit. Like, I just, I love that song so much. Um, and it's like my favorite song right now, I feel like. Great. Um, and then we'll play that. And uh, um, also, selfishly, can you find a way to repress Psychopomp on vinyl so that I- Is it not? I can only, you know, I could only find like two things on Discogs and they were like overseas for a hundred something dollars. Oh my God, what? That's crazy. I will get you one. Um, and yeah, I'll talk to uh, my manager about that. I had no idea. I'm sure that we could get one to you and- um, I would imagine we want to repress it. I think actually it's five years old. And so I think the rights like revert back to me um, now. Right so I think that we probably, <laughs> I think we probably will repress it very soon and, and tours coming up. So I'm sure that we'll, we'll have more of those made. Great. Um, well, thank you so much for crying in H Mart. Um, and thank we can't you, wait. Justin. It's so, so sweet and such a wonderful conversation. Thank you. And we can't wait for Jubilee. I mean, the, pff, we, I mean, we've been, it, it, you, if you're watching I'm from 88.9 and we've been playing it in heavy rotation all the time. And Thank you. It's fantastic. Um, I, and then Posing in Bondage, I was like, this solidifies it as being incredible and I can't wait to listen to the whole record. Thank you, um, Justin. Thank you, Michelle. And thank you, Daniel, for uh, for having me too. And so oh, the thanks are all mine. So <laughs> <laughs> thank this you, was Dan. just an amazing conversation. If you click on a link, you can get to the 88.9, you have some upcoming events. Become a member if you're not a member. Purchase the book from us as well. The books are signed. Um, click on it now and that page will stay with you after we go away. Um, continued success to you. What a wonderful conversation. I think um, just thank you so both so much for this. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you, Basel Books. <laughs>